We'll turn to orbital next. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today and, and to the members of the audience that are here. Um, just a couple of words of introduction about Orbital before I give you the status of our, our uh, COT system and our, uh, our COT's effort in our cargo resupply service uh, program. Orbital has been in existence for approximately 27 years. We've uh, uh, deployed over 500 uh, systems into space, satellites and, and uh, various other um, orbiting vehicles. Uh, we, in the last five years, have over 60 successful launches and uh, the con company is continuing to move in many different directions to support spaceflight both commercially and, and for the U.S. government. And uh, we think that this is a fantastic opportunity for the commercial sector to demonstrate what they can do to support this country. And, maintaining human spaceflight. The um, uh, next slide, please. The uh, COTS architecture is uh, basically five elements. The uh, Cygnus visiting vehicle uh, in includes the service module, and of course on the front of that is the cargo vehicle. Currently we are contracted for eight um, missions on the CRS contract, so we have changed our plan on the COTS mission from an unpressurized cargo module to a pressurized cargo module to demonstrate that capability uh, end to end, including opening the hatch and transferring. Uh, the Taurus II is our, our launch vehicle, and I'll go into more detail on that uh, in a few minutes. And then, uh, of course, we have the cargo operations, which will uh, allow us to work with NASA on the necessary cargo to sustain the station, mission operations to support the flight, and then the uh, integrated launch site operations at Wallops Flight Facility. Next slide. A brief uh, overview of the mission itself uh, from launch. I know this is a very busy slide, but uh, for your read ahead tonight, I guess, on, on the plane. Um, it shows you the, uh, the sequence uh, from launch to uh, rendezvous with the station, uh, berthing by the station arm, and then uh, unberthing and, uh, and deorbiting to, to take the uh, uh, unwanted material from the station. Next slide. Taurus II. Uh, Taurus II was originally planned by the company to fill the medium launch vehicle need in the nation uh, with the uh, end, in, impending end of the uh, Delta II program and the gap that we perceived between uh, uh, some of our larger vehicles, um, such as the uh, Taurus and Minotaur uh, IV and V, and the, uh, and the heavy lift vehicles. Uh, the company decided to embark on a development program that was named Taurus II. As uh, NASA's plans solidified on the uh, COTS and then cargo resupply service, Taurus II became the vehicle that we uh, decided to use for that, that effort and, uh, and is focused on that now. The uh, cargo resupply is uh, its first nine customers, and of course we are marketing to other areas to use uh, Taurus II for uh, supplying the needs of the nation as well as commercial customers. Uh, it will have a great deal of capability and, and uh, and flexibility. It's um, currently just, uh, original missions are, are planned out of Wallops, but we can launch out of other places, as you'll see in just a moment. Uh, dual AJ-26 engines based on the uh, NK-33 engines from, um, from Russia, uh, with a second stage provided by a Castor 30, which uh, is a Heritage 120 engine. Uh, we are also um, uh, working towards an enhanced second stage to fill the higher cargo needs in the out years and, uh, and talking to providers uh, uh, of that second stage at this point. At the moment, um, we are looking towards a, a liquid fuel second stage. The, um, uh, it incorporates flight proven components from uh, leading global suppliers and, uh, and uses subsystems that we've already deployed on, on other orbital launch vehicles. As you'll see on the next slide, we have a legacy all the way back to Pegasus of using those systems, enhancing them, and, and increasing their capabilities. And if you trace through the, the various uh, legacies, you can see that it leads to Taurus II uh, using the leverage of, of our heritage and, and the many years of, of launch success. Next slide. Um, the next couple of slides are a little bit busy, but it's just to show the comparison of the Taurus II projected performance uh, to both low Earth orbit and, and higher. And next slide, as well as a comparison to other 
known launch vehicles in terms of environments and, and uh, performance. Next slide. Payload accommodations, it's a 3.9 meter um, fairing, so it will accommodate uh, most science payloads and of course will accommodate the, um, the pressurized cargo module for the uh, COTS mission as well as the CRS program. Um, it's designed to maximize payload, payload integration uh, to make it efficient and effective. Um, it will be integrated in a, finally uh, in, the, in the flow in a horizontal fashion, uh, will give us access to the payload until 24 hours before launch, and of course we'll maintain all the required uh, contamination control and, and uh, power requirements as we proceed to the launch pad. Next slide. Potential launch sites are listed on this pad. Uh, currently we are working with NASA and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport to develop the <coughs> launch capabilities for a liquid rocket out of Wallops. Uh, that has not been done before, and so we uh, are working through the development uh, aspects of that uh, with a, uh, a lot of cooperation from our, our partners in that. Uh, Wallops will allow us to reach the space station orbit uh, without any problem, uh, either from performance or trajectory. If we uh, have payloads that we're going to fly in the future that require polar or sun synchronous, uh, we have other options uh, as well as the potential to launch out of Cape Canaveral should that need arise in the, in the future. Kodiak is very interested in, uh, in talking to us about uh, launching from there as they develop a uh, new launch pad there. And, and then, of course, Vandenberg is an option for high inclination. Next slide. The work in progress at, uh, at Wallops Island is depicted on this slide. Uh, you can see a number of facilities that uh, will be either modified or updated or built to support this activity. Uh, in the upper left, the cargo processing building exists on the main base now, and that will be used for the early missions for processing the payloads. And then uh, uh, we're looking at developing additional facilities on the island to process as well as to fuel payloads. The horizontal integration facility is a new facility that will be built um, in the next year to, uh, to process two vehicles simultaneously, and then the transporter erector will carry the vehicle from the horizontal integration facility to the pad. The pad is the uh, previous zero A pad that was um, supported solid rockets and now is being modified to, to support liquid uh, fueled rockets and we're installing a liquid fueling facility, of course, to support that, that capability. There are some modifications required to the pad, of course, to support the higher thrust as well as the transporter erector that will carry the, uh, the uh, vehicle to the pad itself. On the next slide, you see a, a depiction of how that uh, will look in the future. In the center of the photograph up there is an uh, is artist, artist rendering of the Taurus II on the pad. Uh, and the um, uh, flame bucket extends out towards the seawall, and so the ramp comes up from inland towards the, uh, towards the launch site, and, the, and then the transport, transporter erector will, will uh, place the, the rocket on the pad approximately uh, less than 24 hours before launch. Um, in addition to the work at Wallops, uh, we are working with uh, Stennis Space Center uh, on constructing an engine test stand that will support our program, the testing of our engines prior to launch. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that's a big hole in the ground, and uh, that's where they are right now, in addition to some support, some support structure. But getting that hole started and, and, uh, and building the, the flame trench to support the engine testing was a, was a big step in cooperation with NASA uh, under a... Uh, Space Act agreement with, with uh, Orbital. Um, that will be a part of our flow of the engines coming from Aerojet in Sacramento. Next slide. Uh, this is, uh, these are the AJ-26 engines. Uh, you, in the lower right, you can see their, uh, the number of engines that are in storage. That's about uh, half of them. And then the engines themselves will be processed, modified, and then shipped to Stennis for testing, and then on to Wallops for, uh, uh, for integration testing there and, and for launch. Next slide. The upper stage uh, on the early missions is a Castor 30. Uh, the static fire of that is scheduled for this month, uh, though I've heard it may delay till July. Uh, ATK is developing this as, a, as an offshoot from the Castor 120 and uh, will provide us with a lot of capability in the, uh, in the early missions and, and possibly some, some, uh, um, some growth directly out of that engine. Next slide. The payload fairing tool gives you a, an idea of the size of the, of the payload fairing and the, and the uh, dimensions, or rather the uh, uh, configuration of it. Next slide. The Cygnus visiting vehicle, um, it's a 
service module on the right hand side with the solar arrays and then on the, the gray on the left side is the pressurized cargo module. As I mentioned, we uh, modified our plans on the uh, COTS mission to move to the pressurized cargo module in order to, to demonstrate that capability. Um, once we were awarded the CRS contract and all of our missions were scheduled to be uh, pressurized cargo. Next slide. The uh, PCM itself uh, will accommodate the uh, uh, number of CTBs that you see up there. We actually think that we can increase the efficiency of the, of the um, uh, uh, cargo stowage inside the, the module and we're working on, on plans to, to do that now. To, uh, to carry more uh, CTBs as well as carry them more efficiently and, and more securely. We can also support, also support powered payloads and, uh, and hard mounted payloads as required uh, as the manifest shapes up. Next slide. The service module itself in an expanded view uh, shows you the various components. Uh, it's fairly standard uh, spacecraft components. Uh, they come from a variety of of providers integrated by orbital at our facility in, uh, in Dulles and uh, tested there. And then the entire uh, spacecraft will be finally assembled at, at Wallops itself after uh, integrated testing and, and environmental testing, which we also do at Dulles. Next slide. Uh, one feature of our, um, our uh, vehicle is the, uh, the PROX system. Uh, similar to Elon's Cuckoo, it will allow us to do the uh, rendezvous and, and approach to the station. Uh, it's based on the same system that the HTV is using, so there's some legacy there as well as the ability for NASA to, to monitor the performance of both systems on both spacecraft and to, and to learn from, from, uh, from them so that we can, as we move down the road, increase capabilities for providing cargo as well as other uh, vehicles more uh, efficiently and safely to the space stations. Next slide. The uh, Cygnus will approach in free flight uh, to a point about 10 meters away from the station, at which point it will be uh, grappled by the station's arm and installed on the, um, uh, on the node and, uh, and the hatch opened for, uh, next slide, for uh, unloading of the, of the cargo. And you can see it will be berthed at node two. Uh, we plan on being there for two to four weeks, depending on the requirements of the crew and, and how long it takes to unload as well as to uh, to, to load it with the, uh, the um, material that would be discarded during, during deorbit. Next slide. Um, just some pictures of the standardized bags that, that uh, we'll be carrying for reference. Next slide. And, uh, and then also, of course, we can carry both powered stowage lockers to a certain extent as well as, uh, as ice pack uh, lockers that can be late loaded for uh, scientific specimens. Next slide. Uh, trash on the ISS, uh, on the right-hand side, that's Carl Waltz, that's not the trash. The left-hand side is, uh, <laughs> is elements of the uh, uh, station crew um, presence that need to be discarded periodically from the station, Ketos and Yedeves, uh, some of which are carried, most of which are carried back on the progress now, but with six people up there, they need to be discarded more frequently, and we hope that everything in them burns up before it gets back to Earth. But, uh, but that will be a part of our job is to help uh, offload the, the hardware and, and waste from the, from the station and uh, dispose of it in the atmosphere. Next slide. And um, we did bid on and have the capability to develop uh, both unpressurized and return cargo capability. We've not been tasked to do that yet by NASA. If that were to happen in the future, then we would, uh, we would get to work on that and, and uh, provide that capability on a, on a reasonable schedule. Uh, along with what we're planned to do today. We do think that, that uh, uh, the work that we're doing today is very important um, for the future of human space flight from this country. Maintaining a hum an American presence on the International Space Station, a robust American presence on the station, uh, and being able to supply them is, is very critical, especially uh, with the uh, transportation gap of the shuttle finishing its missions. Uh, keeping that presence up there is going to be watched by the rest of the world, watched by our own industry and our own young people as they uh, make decisions on where they want to go with their futures and whether they want to go into technology and whether they have a place to go in space. So even though cargo doesn't seem like a, a glamorous uh, profession to be in to start with, it's just uh, one of the elements that we have to maintain in order to keep people flying in space and to keep this country um, maintaining the space station that we've invested so much in. Next slide. 
To summarize the status of our COTS program, uh, we've completed uh, 10 out of our 21 milestones. Uh, system level PDR is complete, and phase one of the safety uh, review panel is complete with uh, phase two coming up in about two months. Um, we changed, as I said, from the unpressurized cargo to pressurized cargo and then updated the Space Act to reflect that and um, uh, changed the mission schedule from late, uh, late 10 to early 11 to reflect the uh, additional work required to, to uh, execute that. For uh, CRS, we completed the first two milestones uh, for the cargo resupply service, and the next major milestone will be the vehicle baseline review at L minus 13 months. And uh, we are currently working the cargo manifesting process with NASA uh, to ensure that, that we understand not only what they're going to fly, but how they want it stowed and how they want it unloaded and how they want it handled in, in space. Next slide. Um, and this is a, uh, an overview of our schedule, uh, as I've already described it, and, um, and you can see the dates on there to, for reference purposes. Next slide. Um, to summarize, I'd like to say again that, that uh, um, even though it's not glamorous carrying cargo, it, it is glamorous for our people to be working on the human spaceflight program, and they're very excited about being a part of this, being a part of the International Space Station. And, uh, and help and continue that mission. Because we know that uh, even as we are working to achieve other goals in space, maintaining our presence on the International Space Station keeps the interest up, it keeps the attention on space, and it keeps Americans flying. Uh, that cannot be overemphasized, I believe. Uh, evolving that capability to understanding what it will take to go further in space, to live longer in space, and to take those capabilities further out from low Earth orbit uh, requires the, uh, the delivery of this cargo and the delivery of the, of the experiments. And we intend to, to do that successfully and to do it uh, cost effectively and efficiently and most importantly, safely. So with that, Mr. Chairman, any questions? Thank you very much. What other questions? I guess you've answered the questions. We thank you. <laughs> Get off. For the briefing. <laughs>